Okay, welcome on. So I think some of you have been waiting for this uh, for some time. Uh, today we go into neural networks at last. Uh, why is everybody so excited about those? Um, the reason is in this graph, which stops in 2015, uh, but it has only become clearer since. Uh, what you see here is the performance in a difficult image recognition challenge. And in blue, you see the methods that people had been engineering uh, in 2010, 11, 12. This was building on decades of, well, decades is maybe exaggerated, but uh, you know, behind each of these methods is a history of five or 10 years of work. And then uh, suddenly in 2012, you know, along came neural networks and they have been doing better ever since. And uh, since then, if you want to win a benchmark or competition of any kind, you need to have a neural network somewhere in there in your pipeline. And you know, why are they so successful or why were they previously not so successful? Um, the story is pretty easy. On the one hand, uh, a few tricks have been discovered, if maybe not understood. Um, for example, what activation function to use does make a huge difference. So if you, you know, for decades in, in textbooks and in teaching, uh, we have been looking at uh, sigmoid activation functions. And it turns out that when you build a deep neural network consisting of many layers, it simply is much, much better uh, to have something like this, uh, which is called a rectified linear, linear unit. So it just lets uh, the positive uh, variables go through unchanged and uh, negative ones are set to nil. Uh, so small details like this have made a huge difference. And then secondly, neural networks have been riding piggyback on the hardware advances. Uh, notably, they have been able to uh, profit from the uh, amazing uh, graphical processing units that are available these days with uh, thousands of processors, uh, each of which can only do fairly simple tasks, but it happens to be a good match for typical neural network architectures, especially those used in image processing, so-called convolutional neural networks that we'll talk more about uh, next week. Um, so, you know, what are the, uh, what are the strong points in neural networks? that uh, they can uh, let me say represent much training data or learn this training data by heart if you like uh, what i mean by that is if you look at the performance of conventional methods they typically uh, as you feed the more and more training data, uh, performance will plateau, it will converge to some level and not be able to increase beyond that level. In terms of the neural networks, um, they keep learning as you add more and more training data. Um, they also can profit from fast hardware better than other methods. So let's say if you give me a classical shallow classifier, uh, let's say, you know, I can afford to train uh, a thousand decision trees in a second, and that will work reasonably well. And then if you give me a computer 100 times the size, uh, then I can train 100,000 decision trees, but the, the accuracy will not be much better. So again, uh, shallow classifiers, they plateau much earlier uh, when it comes to using more hardware. And with neural networks, um, especially when you're a social media company with uh, you know, warehouses full of computers, if you train a neural network for a day, it will do fine. If you train it for a week, it will do better. And if you train it for 10 years in parallel, of course, over many GPUs, it will do better still. Um, so given enough training data, um, they will be able to really leverage this, uh, the progress that we've seen in the development of hardware, uh, which shallow classifiers 
cannot. Um, what's also good is that they can learn problem-specific features. These features may not work as well in a, in a different problem, but for a given problem at hand, the specific features that Neural Network can learn are usually difficult to beat. And finally, they can be trained end-to-end. -end. Which means, if you compare this uh, to the past, you would give some input into a first module of a pipeline, which you could optimize, and the output would go into a second module of a pipeline, which you would optimize, and so on, until you produce some output. And uh, with a neural network, the sport these days is to you know, represent all of this by a single neural network and to optimize the entire thing jointly, rather than each of the modules individually. Uh, why did one not do that you know, from, from the beginning? One reason uh, are the limitations in hardware that have uh, been overcome in the meantime. But another reason is that uh, when you have such a modular system, <clears throat> it is possible to train each of these modules optimally. So you might even be able to find a global optimum for the parameters in each of these models, uh, modules under some loss. And when you train the whole thing jointly, uh, you will typically only be able to find some local optimum of the parameters. And well, you know, which of these is better? Uh, I think many people, and that includes me, expected that it's better uh, to train modules separately but optimally. But it so turns out empirically that it is better to train the entire thing jointly or end to end, even if you only find a local optimum for your parameters. For your many parameters, because uh, today's deep neural networks, they can have millions of parameters. Okay, those are the advantages. Uh, and then there are, of course, many disadvantages, um, primarily uh, the hunger for uh, lots of training data, uh, the hunger for big hardware and the fact that neural networks, even relatively simple ones, um, they're poorly understood. It's not really clear why they work so well. Okay. Now, when I say neural network, I should be a bit more specific because different communities have come up with you know, different meanings of uh, neural network. Um, so maybe the biggest division is into uh, spiking or non-spiking neural networks and um, by spiking neural networks uh, these are sometimes uh, I've messed up my tree I see here um, these uh, spiking neural networks they try to imitate what is going on in a, in a biological brain so you have neurons that communicate with each other uh, in terms of uh, single impulses um, or action potentials. And of course, we have a famous group here in Heidelberg, the neuromorphic group uh, that is trying to build you know, big analog computers imitating biological brains. And then there are the non-spiking neurons, uh, which exchange information just in terms of numbers that are shoved uh, between neurons. And uh, these are the more mainstream ones nowadays. Um, then in non-spiking neurons, we can have uh, stochastic or deterministic ones. Um, in stochastic neural networks, we maintain a distribution over the parameters in the network. In uh, the other case, we have uh, deterministic values for our parameters. Uh, then there are they are also called neural networks, uh, a special flavor, these Boltzmann machines, but really they are undirected graphical models. Um, and then we have finally the, the multilayer perceptrons or feed forward neural, network, neural networks, uh, which can be either recurrent or uh, just directed acyclic graphs. And uh, these are today uh, the workhorses. So whenever you read 
of a neural network solving a new complicated problem, um, it will be one of these. Neural networks are especially, or the recurrent neural networks are particularly um, successful in language processing, uh, but they're also sometimes used in computer vision. And then there are other flavors which I've not included here, uh, ones that have access to a differentiable memory. Um, these are systems like the neural Turing machines uh, and others. Okay, but these feed-forward neural networks are really the thing that people typically use to solve machine learning or pattern recognition problems. Okay, and here uh, I want to illustrate this in terms of a famous toy example. I have here a two-dimensional feature space with features x1 and x2. And uh, the red crosses are one class and the blue circles are another class. And, you know, the first thing you would try in machine learning is to try and fit a linear classifier. A linear classifier will do okay here, but it will not be able to fit all trading data perfectly. Now, really, you know, if these red and blue points, if this was all the training data that we do have, then actually a linear classifier is all I would recommend fitting here, simply because we have so little training data and you don't want to overfit it. But um, let us pretend that these red and blue points are just representative of uh, many more that we have in the training set and that we do want to go beyond a linear classifier. And uh, here's how we can go about it. Huh? We can find a green linear classifier, which neural network people also call the perceptron. We can find a blue linear classifier, a second perceptron. And then we can ask questions like, uh, and you know, each perceptron here has a normal vector. And then I can ask questions like, is an observation above the one perceptron or above the other perceptron? And by above, I mean, is it in the direction into which this normal vector points? And if I answer this question, um, is it above uh, both perceptrons, then uh, in this part of space here, uh, the answer would be plus one. Yes, it's above the green perceptron. And plus one, it's above, in quotes, above the blue perceptron, meaning in the direction which the normal vector points. Um, in the top right corner, I have already written, uh, the answers would be, yes, it's above the green perceptron, but not above the blue. So it would be plus one, minus one. Here, the answer would be minus one, minus one. And here, the answer would be minus one, plus one. Okay, and now if we uh, made each of these decisions hard decisions, just yes or no decisions, uh, I would get only four distinct coordinates out. So I have partition feature space and all points in this region here would map to plus one, plus one. All points in this area would map to plus one, minus one, and so on. And uh, in fact, if I use this extreme mapping, then my points end up in the coordinates that you see in this plot here. Yeah, so. Uh, all the blue points end up with the coordinate plus one, plus one, and the red ones end up, you know, in these other three coordinates. And now in this new artificial representation, uh, I can find a successful linear classifier shown here in yellow, which perfectly separates my observations from each other. So now I'm able in this new representation to perfectly fit my training data with a linear classifier. So one way to think about it is that uh, my first two perceptrons were used to create new features. And in this new feature space, I then used a second classifier. And uh, this entire thing has here been uh, summarized in this uh, schematic diagram, uh, which looks like you know, an electrical wiring diagram or something uh, on the top. Uh, and let's go through this in detail. So. I have um, these circles, which re represent perceptrons. And then for each circle, I have a couple of inputs. I have my input x1, the first feature. I have my input x2, so the second feature value. And I have a constant input of plus one uh, because I want be 
to be able to shift my perceptron. This is called a bias. So um, these are my inputs. And then uh, all these inputs are weighted. So for example, uh, this one is weighted multiplicatively with WA1. This one is weighted multiplicatively with WA2. And this one here with WA3. Or altogether, I can write it as you see here, x1 times wa1 plus x2 times wa2 plus, I have my constant bias, times wa3. Or shorter still, I can write this as an inner product of uh, x and wa. Now, previously I said I can ask something like a yes or no question. So I want uh, to send, uh, so what I've just computed by computing the inner product of some coordinate x and my normal vector wa has been the, dis the sine distance from my hyperplane. So positive numbers means I'm in the direction in which the normal vector points, negative result means I'm on the other side. And now I want to ask this yes or no question. So one way to ask this yes or no question is to use uh, just a step function, which gives me an output of plus one for positive input and output of minus one for negative inputs. This would be a precise model for this yes or no question that I asked. Um, and then, you know, similarly, this was the green perceptron. I can do the same thing for my blue hyperplane uh, for the blue perceptron. Uh, I can also use here a step function as nonlinearity. And I have now constructed uh, two new features, which I have called here phi A and phi B. And uh, here, this phi a and phi b are now my new coordinates. And in this new coordinate system or new feature space, I can then fit a third perceptron shown here in yellow. Okay. So we have a number of perceptrons and we have somehow coupled them together. And in this case here, we have two layers, one hidden layer, one output layer. Uh, we can have more than, uh, we can have more hidden layers. And in general, this thing here is called a multi-layer perceptron or MLP for short. All right. Now, here we use as nonlinearity this crisp function, the step function, which gives us plus one or minus one. Um, this works well for our toy example here, but uh, I had judiciously you know, chosen these perceptrons so that they generate the correct predictions. And uh, if we, however, want to train such a system, uh, it is difficult if we use these step functions as nonlinearities, uh, because uh, let's say if a blue point is on this side of the decision boundary, it's mapped to the correct answer. But if it's if it moves by one millimeter and now sits on the wrong side, I suddenly get a mistake. And this transition between having made a correct prediction and having made a mistake happens suddenly as I change my parameters. So instead of the observation, I could also have moved my uh, hyperplane. Yeah? So uh, this one worked perfectly. Uh, this one would also work perfectly. But if I move it by an epsilon, you see now the red observation is on the wrong side. So suddenly I would incur an error. And if I change my parameter for the normal vector just a little bit, I suddenly get the correct prediction. So it means the landscape this, uh, of my loss as a function of the parameters would be a piecewise constant function. And it is difficult to find the minimum over such a piecewise constant function, because I do not know in which direction I should change my parameters. And this is the reason why uh, it is preferred to use smooth activation functions so that my loss as a function of the parameters will become a smoother function. It will become easier to optimize. 
And uh, these remaining plots here, these three plots show you the mapping that I obtain for my training set when I make my activation function less extreme, if I make it less, uh, you know, jumpy. Now, arguably, the simplest activation function that I could use would be just the identity. So to just not, you know, not do anything. Um, and this is, in fact, what has happened on the left side. So if you look closely, my training data, it has been rotated and maybe distorted a little bit. But uh, the data is just as, uh, it's not linearly separable here, just as it was not linearly separable in the original feature space. And well, why is that? Why did this activation function not help at all? So this uh, projection onto the normal vector is just a linear operator. And uh, if I then, you know, the identity means doing nothing. Uh, so what, what I have if I use the identity as activation function is that I have simply transformed my trading data in a linear fashion. So I've used some affine transformation of my trading data and uh, so affine transformations, they include rotations and uh, uh, translations and so on. Uh, but they do not change really the arrangement of the points. Yeah? So if the data was not linearly separable in the original feature space, if I then use a linear transformation, it will still not be linearly separable. This is why it's really important to have nonlinear activation functions. And the activation functions that, uh, that I did use to make these plots are shown here at the bottom. So on the very right-hand side, the activation function used was a step function. On the very left-hand side, it was the identity function. And in between, um, these have been uh, step functions of various steepness. Any questions so far? Yeah? Uh, are always basing a zero line true or it can be arbitrary? Um, the um, activation function must be nonlinear, but it doesn't have to be to map to zero one. It can map to minus one plus one or to minus infinity plus infinity to anything really. <coughs> More questions? Yeah. And what's the intention uh, behind rectifying the because they are kind of linear, I guess. Um, well, if they were linear, they wouldn't work at all. The question was, what's the intuition behind rectified linear units? So the rectified linear unit in the same picture here would be to cancel negative inputs and to leave the positive outputs unchanged. Um, you know, arguably, this is the simplest nonlinearity that anyone could invent. Yeah, so, uh, and it's super efficient to implement in, uh, in low-level programming. Um, it also has the nice effect that uh, if the output was positive, uh, the gradient is not changed, so it's not inflated or it's not subdued. And uh, this is why uh, the rectifying linear unit is considered helpful with deep systems to let some of the gradient arrive at the very early layers. Um, and, you know, I would say the rectified linear unit, it's maybe still the first thing that uh, one would try nowadays, but in fact, uh, there has been an explosion in the literature about, you know, what activation functions are good. Yeah? And uh, so the ReLU that you mentioned is this one here, um, but then leaky units have been proposed. They still need to be nonlinear, but uh, they don't go uh, to zero. 
or you can have systems uh, which are some constant and then increase uh, linearly or you can have systems which here on the left converge to some constant but then have a smooth transition and then eventually uh, uh, continue on the positive side. So a famous one here is the exponential linear unit uh, which works very well. Uh, so there's a whole zoo of these out there now. And for some, like the exponential linear unit, uh, hand-waving arguments can be made for why this is good. Um, so uh, very approximately one can argue that this exponential linear unit makes the Fisher information matrix better conditioned and that means natural gradient will be closer to the Cartesian gradient. And why this is a good thing, we will discuss two weeks from now. More questions? Okay, um, let's walk through a toy example here. A uh, famous one is this one, playground.tensorflow.org. Um, who has seen this before? One, two, three, okay. Um, so it's just a nice interactive example. Let me scale this to a nice size. All right. Um, I can uh, generate... Uh, I can generate various trading data sets, easier or harder ones. Um, so in this uh, here two-dimensional feature space, then I can uh, consider various features. In the simplest case, you will just use these linear features here, x1 and x2. So this means it's just the, the x and, well, it's just the two positions in your feature space. It is also possible um, to use nonlinear features in addition, uh, which amounts to uh, kernelizing your classifier, essentially. So people who have studied the support vector machine will know that either one can define some similarity measure between points or one can directly embed the points in a higher dimensional space and then use a linear classifier. And this is done by adding nonlinear functions of the inputs, which I'm not doing for now. Um, then in this tool, you can uh, add or remove hidden layers. And within a hidden layer, you can add or remove neurons. Okay. Well, moreover, you can uh, choose your activation function here. And uh, let's just see you know, what this gives with two neurons. Uh, we now try and, tr and fit this uh, tiny neural network to this training data. And on the right hand side, you see color coded the prediction. In the network itself, you see color coded the weights. And we get out a classifier which is, you know, not, not terribly bad, but also, you know, not a perfect fit to the structure of our training data. I can, uh, you know, reinitialize this with other random numbers, and uh, so each time, you know, I press this button here, I initialize randomly the parameters in my neural network, and when I press this play button here, I now modify the parameters so as to reduce the loss over my training set, and the loss you see it indicated here on the right hand side. So it's been dropping very fast initially, and now we cannot really reduce it any further. Let's run into a different local optimum. And you see, each time I reinitialize my, par my parameters from scratch, I can end up in the same local optimum, or I may also end up in a different local optimum. Okay, now this decision boundary here is not very satisfactory yet, so... Uh, and I can visualize what each of the neurons here is doing and what their combination is doing. So let's add a third neuron in the hidden layer. And now I will for the first time be able 
if I find a good local optimum, to really fit this data. Okay. I am happy with this uh, example because it showed that you know, we first became a little bit better, uh, then our error dropped a lot as we reached a better configuration, and then the system was stable in a local optimum, or let's say it was caught in a very flat valley for a long time before it eventually made it across uh, a pass and then uh, found access into a much lower valley, which now actually is a good one. Uh, so now we have a nice fit to our uh, trading data. And I like this plot here because this is what can happen in real life, only uh, that you don't spend seconds watching this, but days. Yeah? So uh, you train your neural network after a day, you know, it starts to do something useful. Then you wait for a week and nothing happens and you wonder, should you kill the process or not? And then on the eighth day, breakthrough, <laughs> it reaches, you know, a, a deeper valley. Okay. And now, you know, in, in two dimensions, we can easily see that, you know, it was satisfactory or not, or why not. But in a million dimensional space, it's very difficult to, you know, make, make sense of where exactly you are in your training. All you see is how well you're doing on your training data. Okay, and so what, what has happened here? Um, this neuron would, uh, by itself, would make this prediction. That neuron by itself would make that prediction. This neuron by itself would make that prediction. And now these predictions are combined here with a weight of 1.8, with a weight of minus 1.8, and a weight of plus 1.8. So we have a linear combination. Uh, so this one, it, essentially, its sign is being flipped. And overall, uh, we get the result that you see on the right-hand side, which is a decent fit. Let's try this again. If we do this a few times, you know, so this time we did not get stuck in the local optimum for so long. It's also possible uh, to get stuck in a local optimum and never escape from it. So I have had runs where I did not manage to find this good fit that we all see now. Okay, this time we convert every time. Fine, good. Uh, let's look at the activation function. Uh, let's pick here a rectifying linear unit. And I would argue that if we repeat this a couple of times, that even a tiny network like this, we see that it converges to a solution faster than with a sigmoid. Okay. Good. So for relatively easy examples like this one, uh, a single hidden layer is enough. For harder examples, we may need more hidden layers and we might need... So when we want to invest more neurons, there's always a choice of do we want to make the network wider so do we want to add more neurons <laughs> to a given hidden layer or do we want to make it deeper? Do we want to add more hidden layers? And in general, um, the network has can fit more highly nonlinear things if you make it deeper rather than wide, but training also becomes more difficult. Okay, so we generally fail, you know, to fit the spiral here. And let's just see if we add another hidden layer, if we can do any better here. Nope. Okay, I'll, you can play with this more uh, <laughs> at home. Okay. So this is all very well, um, but in this example here, I put the perceptrons in the right place manually, and 
in a million dimensional parameter space or a feature space, we cannot do this. So we need some means of finding the parameters automatically. And in this uh, online demo, you have already seen that happening. Um, the algorithm used to do this uh, usually is called backpropagation. Um, and in backpropagation, you simply consider your multilayer perceptron as a nested set of functions and then apply the chain rule to find the best parameters in this. Uh, I will tell you much more about this after the break. Right now, are there any more questions? And for the toy example, there is the offset uh, one times weight. Uh, and didn't, uh, or they didn't uh, have this. Um, so the question was about the bias. Yes. Um, where does it come in? Let's see. I think there is a... Oh, we have zero hidden layers. We need one at least. Ah, okay, I, I find it. Um, you see here this tiny box, okay? Uh, and the connection between the bias and the, uh, and the box here is not shown, but, but there it is. Yeah? And this is also learned, the bias. So if I now, uh, let's see, it says I can click on this to edit. Let's see if this is true. Uh, click anywhere to edit. So if I change this number, this means it will shift my neuron in space. Have you seen this yeah. shift? Yeah, exactly. Okay. More questions? Yeah? Uh, okay so um, the question was what's the difference between uh, between adding urines to make the network wider versus adding urines to make the network deeper. Yeah? So if I add, uh, let's say, another neuron in this space here, I will add a third dimension to my feature space. And as I keep adding more dimensions, uh, the so-called function counting theorem tells me that I will be able to fit more complicated distributions with a linear classifier. On the other hand, uh, as I make the network deeper, uh, one way of thinking about this, you know, if we take a polynomial uh, activation function, uh, you know, it would be completely legal to take as activation function, uh, for example, here a parabola. And then as we make the network deeper, uh, this is like multiplying these uh, parabola to obtain higher order polynomials. And the, uh, the complexity, now if I project back my decision boundaries to the feature space, then given sufficiently nonlinear activation functions, the complexity of classifiers that I can express with a deep network grows faster than the complexity of classifiers that I can express by increasing the dimensionality of my uh, intermediate representations. Uh, in practice, you need both. Yeah? So in the extreme example, if I only used a width of one, then already my first neuron 
So that means if I did create a neural network which only consists of a sequence of neurons, then already my first neuron would project all my observations to a line. And then, uh, yes, I can do, you know, and then whatever else happens afterwards has to operate on these coordinates. So that would be one extreme example. <coughs> So, the current networks are actually both very wide and very deep. So we use, let's say, in a, in a vision network, uh, the early layers uh, may have 30 or 60 types of neurons in width, and then maybe 100 layers in depth. Um, so you need both width and depth to solve reasonably complicated problems. More questions? Yeah? And, uh, for example, if you have uh, uh, the weight, for example, how much data do I need in order to train for Xiaomi and find the way to, for the algorithm to convert somewhere? How many iterations do I need? How many training how epochs? How many uh, data? Ah. Which if I go and to make my network live and big, how much data do I need? Okay, difficult question. The question was how much data do I need to train my network? So um, usually you want to make your network, uh, you know, to keep increasing its size until you can uh, perfectly fit your training data. So that means overfit. Uh, and then you can turn on regularization. Yeah, to reduce some of the more extreme weights. Um, also, when you have too little training data, often you try and emulate more training data. So um, both to make your network invariant, let's say to noise. Yeah, if you want to make your network invariant to noise, you could use your same training data, but add artificial noise to your inputs and still try and make let the network predict the correct output. Yeah. Um, but you know, I cannot give you a very simple answer of what is enough training data. So like I said, deep neural networks, they have millions of parameters. On the other hand, if we talk about computer vision, the images have millions of pixels, or each image has millions of pixels, but the information in those pixels is not independent. It's not like, so each pixel is not an independent measurement. Um, now these, on this problem here, this was an image classification problem with 1000 different classes. So, you know, this kind of dog, that kind of dog, a cat, house, etc. And uh, here, a million training examples were used to successfully train these networks. And if you can, uh, this is called pre-training, if you can train your network on a data set which is not identical to your data set of interest, but somehow similar, and then you start from those parameters when you optimize your own network, then you will need littler training <laughs> data. But you know, you don't hear me give really any solid numbers because it really depends on the architecture and how difficult your problem is and so on. Uh, bottom line is, in, generally speaking, you need lots of training data, whatever that means. <laughs> Sorry, I cannot be really quantitative here. So in real life, you will be given a finite amount of training data, which you try to augment by you know, adding noise and so on, like I just explained. Um, then you will start with a small network and increase it gradually until you overfit or uh, until you're able to perfectly fit your training data. 
and then you prune or then you start regularizing and then this is uh, uh, your this is then a good guess of something that will work on the test data or you can of course use techniques like cross validation uh, where you cross validate over architectures of different depth um, finding the proper architecture automatically is uh, an area of active research but not at all mature yet super thick and it has uh, millions of parameters, it's uh, really difficult to use the cross-validation to tune the have of parameters for them, the number of layers and number of neurons. Yes. It probably take a few days. For yes, that's very expensive to uh, find these architectures on automatically, yes. You better have lots of GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any better strategy to tune the like, uh, have how much uh, Neurons or how much layer do I need for this uh, task? Well, um, so next week I will talk more about architectures. And uh, usually what you do is you start from an architecture that has been published. Um, if the problem is similar enough to yours, you even start with the parameters that these other people found. and. You know, if I have modest amounts of training data, I would start with a smallish so-called UNET or VGG16. If you have uh, much more images, you will start with a bigger network. So it takes, you know, it's a matter of experience of fitting or finding the right architecture to match your data set. And this is one of the things that I would, you know, cite as one of these drawbacks of neural networks that there is this lot of empiricism involved in both choice of architecture and then the shepherding of the actual optimization process. So it's not satisfactory, I agree, um, but you know that's the reality, I'm afraid. Okay, let's have a 10 minute break and then we look into backprop.